The, thank you everyone for completing the team up uh, assignment. So we have formed the four teams, okay? So every team will have uh, approximately equal number of uh, in-person uh, section students and the virtual section students. And hopefully you guys will work well together. And uh, um, next time when you um, attend a lab or submit to a lab report, please uh, designate a team leader. Um, so if I have any, you know, um, if I need to collect any experimental data, I can simply email the um, team leader for, from each group. So um, this week I will do a steel retort experiment. So I'm going to upload a uh, lab handout uh, tomorrow or Thursday, because I still need to finalize it uh, with uh, uh, Molly uh, before I can upload it. So basically every team will have to process one type of food or um, you know, cheat, uh, um, so or do different treatments. And finally, you guys will do the um, uh, lethality calculation and some quality check to find out uh, the optimal processing conditions for each retort. So that's the goal, okay? So I'll explain more about the lab details um, on Thursday's class. Okay, so for today's lecture, we are going to learn about uh, pasteurization. And I think you, many of you have learned about it in the lower, lower level of the, um, um, for the processing class, like 204, 330. So today we are going to uh, go to more comprehensive, um, uh, um, the, the, achieve those more comprehensive objectives, okay? So first, uh, we're going to start with very uh, basic ones, the criteria and the basic and the basic purposes of the food pasteurization. And we're going to classify different uh, pasteurization systems. Um, okay, I think uh, you might have learned about it. And uh, then we're going to explain what is exactly the HTST and UHT system like in the food industry and what are the key components are there. And we'll also calculate the uh, energy regen regeneration. And uh, we'll learn about what is log mean temperature and the, what is the impact of using different type of flow like counter uh, co column flow or counter flow. And finally, we'll try to think about how to design a pasteurization system, okay? All right, so let's review some of the, uh, some basic uh, um, uh, knowledge that we have learned in the, in the lower level of the food processing class. So in pasteurization, we are not killing all the microorganisms, right? But instead, we are trying to destroy those vegetative pathogens, right? So that we can ensure the food safety. For example, in the milk, we have salmonella, we have E. coli, listeria, and the campylobacter, right? So those are the key uh, uh, pathogens that we want to make sure that we eliminate during the milk processing. And the, for the spoilage microorganisms, we are not going to destroy all of them, right? But instead, we will reduce their numbers so the spoilage of the milk during storage can be slowed down, right? So those microorganisms like Bacillus and the Streptococcus. Okay. And finally, for some, if we are processing juice, we want to inactivate enzymes, right? So some enzymes like uh, polyphenol oxidase, right? The browning enzyme, and some pectic enzyme that will change the texture during storage. Okay. So those are the three main purposes for the pressurization. So we know that uh, pasteurization is a highly time and temperature dependent process, right? And uh, we want to um, determine, if we want to determine the best time and the temperature to process a certain type of food, first we need, need to identify what are our targets, right? So our targets are those pathogens, right? So in the milk, I guess you guys probably learned that uh, our the indicator or the targeting pathogen for milk it's called uh, coxella bernetti right if you don't remember then please uh, uh, 
can try, try to uh, highlight here. Okay, so so for different uh, um, type of food, we we have different um, targets, but this is some animal um, pathogen that we usually target for in a pasteurization process. And uh, typically we are seeking for five log reduction, okay? So remember that in sterilization, we're usually looking for 12D reduction, right? And uh, we, in that case, we'll target at uh, cross GDM botulinum. So that's the difference. And uh, of course, other pathogens we will also eliminate like uh, um, Streptococcus, Listeria, Clostridium, Bacillus. So we, uh, once we can kill all the co co uh, Coxella bernetti, then we will make sure that other bacteria are also killed, other pathogens, because they are less thermal resistant, okay? So this, these are the thermal, uh, the pasteurization purposes and the by uh, identifying target and microorganisms. So we all, we all learned that in milk, we have three types of uh, pasteurization. Uh, basically, we have low temperature, long time, LTLT. -LT. Basically, it's 63 degrees C for at least 30 minutes. And we have high temperature, short time, which in short is uh, HTST, right? And uh, which is, the temperature will be 72 degrees C and we can reduce the temperature uh, to the, the time to 15 seconds from 30 minutes, right? And finally, we have ultra high temperature. So in ultra high temperature, we use um, the temperature even greater than boiling point, like 135 degrees C, and the processing time is usually a couple seconds, okay? So those are three different types of uh, milk processing we use. Okay, so if you look up to the market, uh, you can find all these products processed with different uh, uh, pasteurization strategies. For example, the, um, the LTLT, low temperature, long time, uh, we, we can really find it because uh, um, it's very uh, slow process, right? And that's only one that I found from the, uh, the uh, if I search uh, the Google uh, in the grocery store, that's the only product uh, basically, it's out of date. And uh, if you, uh, there are a lot of uh, UHT process, right? If you look at this Horizon DHA Omega 3, this one is uh, ultra pressurized, okay? And a lot of other ultra pressurized. And even there are some ultra filtered micro uh, product and some sterilized, okay? So the reason that uh, uh, we have not being using a lot of LTLT process, it's because the, the, the processing time has been super long, okay? So um, for example, uh, for the LTLT process, we need to put them into a batch, right? Because uh, the processing time is about 30 minutes, okay? So there's no, uh, it's hard to design a, a continuous process that uh, if we want to hold, the food in the in the in the system for thirty minutes. So typically, uh, this is something that uh, has been very old, and uh, we can not really find those products in the market. Okay. So our focus today is to talk about uh, the modern uh, pasteurization system. Okay. So basically, our uh, HTST and the UHT process. Well. So the diagram here is the, the most typical uh, design of a HTST system. So if you look at the system, you have, we have two colors, right? Um, the color, the, the, the blue color means the, the cold product. And if, if you see the red or orange color, that means the, the, the milk has been heated up. Okay. So, if you look at the chart, you can see the product comes in to the storage tank or balance tank. And uh, they'll be hold for a little while in this tank. And there will be a pump that is pumping the milk through the pipes into the regeneration section. We'll focus a lot on the regeneration sec uh, section today. Okay, so in the regeneration system, you can see that uh, the, the milk, the color changes from blue 
to orange. That is because on the other stream, we have the heated milk that is heating up the, 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 the raw milk before processing, right? So this is like, a, you, think, you can think about it, it is uh, working as a heat exchanger. Basically, we use the processed milk to heat up the raw milk, okay? And, and this is step we can preheat the, 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 the milk before um, to save some energy, right? And then the milk comes to the timing pump. So the timing pump, basically we're trying to control the flow rate, okay? And then we, have, we connect the timing pump to a homogenizer. So the homogenizer sometimes is connected in the pasteurization system to reduce the um, one step of processing because sometimes we use an independent homogenizer. In that case, we need two equipments, but in, in the modern dairy uh, industry, the homogenizer is usually incorporated inside the pressurization system, okay? So after homogenizer, um, the, the milk will go, in, go into the heating section. So the heating section, the milk will be further heated to the, for example, if it's HTST to process, it will be heated to 72 degrees C, okay? And then in, after the, it's heated to the temperature, the milk will be keep in the holding tank. And in the holding tank, the, the, the time will last for 15 seconds to make sure the milk is processed properly. And then there will be a flow diversion valve. So what do you think, why do we need a flow diversion valve, guys? Any ideas? Well, it just kind of looks like it can go two ways uh, yes. to get back to the timing pump. Yes, so you can see, good, good, good point, Kalayo. You, uh, you find a very good detail. So it, it diverges, right? It, part of it goes to the regeneration system, right? After regeneration, it's kind of, it will be, ex um, it will exit the entire system as a product out. But another direction, it goes back all the way back to the balance tank. So why, so, so why do we split them? Uh, in which case do you think uh, we'll have to go back to the balance tank? If the processing parameters weren't met. Good, good point, good point, AB. So if the processing is not well done, then all the product will be redirected to the balance tank and they're being reproduced, right? So, so the, so the flow diversion valve is more working as a checking point to decide whether the product is done or not, right? So, so what do you think it checks? What parameter do you think uh, it is monitoring? Temperature. Good point, Lauren. So temperature, right? If the temperature is greater than 72, which means our HTST has hold it for greater than 15 seconds at above 72 degrees C, right? But if the temperature, final temperature here is lower than 72, then there's a potential safety hazard, right? So, so, so here, so this is like a checkpoint for us to make sure the milk is proce uh, processed uh, sufficiently. And after the checking point, um, the well done product goes to the heat regeneration section to convey some energy uh, back to the uh, to the uh, to the raw milk to preheat them, right? And then finally, they will be cooled down by the cooling section, right? So the cooling section is to make sure that uh, our milk um, is not over uh, cooked, right? Because otherwise, if we if we if the milk exit the system with like 60 degrees C, then it's still still cooking, right? Which is because it's still um, uh, close to the temperature of the LTLT um, process. So the cooling section will further cool down the milk um, product to the room temperature or even lower. So we use um, other uh, water uh, stream. So the heating section also reduces the cooling water that we needed to uh, remove the energy here, right? 
and those unqualified product will move back to the rebalance, the balance bank to be processed again. So that's the typical design of the HTST system. So basically you can see we have three heat exchangers. Uh, the white heat exchanger, the cooling system, um, the regeneration system is another heat exchanger. And finally, we have a heating section. Basically, we uh, have another heat, uh, heating media here. Typically, it's uh, steam or other hot liquids. Okay. So, guys, any questions about this system? Okay, so let's look at those key components in the system. First, uh, we have a balance tank, right? So the purpose of balance tank is to maintain um, the, the level of the product to make sure that we have a constant stream of feed flow, flow rate in the system, right? And also um, the, the balance tank has always need to be placed lower physically lower than the, those heat, uh, heat exchangers because um, that's for the safety concern. This is uh, one of the safety design here because uh, a lot of cases when we're trying to drain it or if there's any um, you know, um, a leak in the tank, they might, if, if it's not placed higher than those heat exchanger, they might leak to contaminate the, the, the food products, okay? And the balance tank is usually uh, closed because that contains the pathogen. And also we don't want to, um, the, the milk to be, um, you know, uh, to be con con contacting with the air. And the second part is the regenerator. I, uh, I have a video here too for you guys to watch. If you, we have time, we can watch it today. And uh, okay, we should have time. Um, so the regenerator is to save the heating and cooling energy. Basically, it's a heat exchanger that we can preheat our um, uh, raw milk using the, the, the pressure, uh, pressurized milk. Okay, and uh, the height. Um, so there's another height we have to be, um, uh, be careful. The pressurized side has always need to be placed higher than the unpressurized. Uh, side, because uh, we, um, in other case, um, because it, once it's leak, we don't want any contamination to occur, right? Because if we have the unpressurized side on the top, once it leaked, the, 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 the milk contains pathogen will drop on the tube of the pressurized side, and then that can cause potential contamination. And the typically, uh, in terms of the regeneration efficiency, uh, we can reach over 90%. And later on, we'll talk about what does the net 90% mean of the uh, regeneration. Okay. We'll do a, a couple of the, of the uh, calculation. Okay, so let's watch uh, a video about a, a typical um, heat regenerator is a uh, more like a uh, heat um, exchanger that is plate heat exchanger, right? Um, and also in, if you go to the uh, Dairy Institute, uh, Dairy Innovation Institute, Institute at Cal Poly, we also have a, a, a pressurization system. And in their facility, the, 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 um, the heat exchanger is more like a tube heat exchanger. So uh, it's pretty much depending on the design, we use different types of uh, heat exchangers. The plate one is more, uh, is maybe more efficient than tube one because that has greater contacting area. And later on, we'll discuss um, which case we, uh, which type of uh, heat exchanger we use and what are the criteria we pick them. Okay. Um, and, just uh, quickly. Yes, go ahead. Why um, were some of the plates like flipped upside down and then Yes, that's a good point. That's a good point, Kyle. Um, um, so that's to control, uh, a short answer is that the, that is to control the flow direction because some cases we have cold current flow, some cases we have counter flow. And the, 
we'll do a lot of calculation today trying to decide which flow is better than the other and which direction you have to put them together. Good, good point, Kali. And uh, okay, so let's uh, come back here. So the next one is the timing pump, okay? So if you forget, if you don't remember, the timing pump is between the heat regeneration section and the, the homogenizer, okay? So basically it's just a positive re displacement pump that controls the flow rate of the of the entire system because uh, um, there are different types of pumps, right? We have some like some pump like pressure pump to prevent uh, the backflow, right? The the placement pump is better accurately to control the flow rate, okay? So that can because our holding time in the tube is pretty much depending on how much the flow rate that we apply. Right. So by, by tuning the, or adjust, adjusting the timing pump, we can extend or uh, uh, shorten the, the holding time. And then the homogenizer. So homogenizer is one of the uh, very complex equipment in, food, uh, in, the, in the new pressurization system. Uh, basically, we're trying to break down those large fat globules into smaller ones, okay? So this is a very tricky part because uh, um, uh, many of you might, might not see, you, you guys might not never see what is the un unhomogenized milk look like. So basically if the milk is not homogenized, uh, the, 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 size, the size of fat is typically very large. In that case, because we know that fat has lower density than water, so if they are large, then they, they tend to float to the top and are called the creaming. So uh, if you guys um, ever heat up or boil any milk product before, you'll see there's a, uh, a small layer of oil flow on the top, especially for those 2% um, um, fat milk product. Okay. So, but after our homogenization process, we can actually break down those um, large globules into smaller emulsion droplets. So in that case, uh, because uh, the size of the, heat, the fat gets smaller, then the density difference between the water and the fat, fat, fat globule becomes slower, uh, smaller. So their kind of running motion, running motion is the uh, like random movement that will dominate the gravity. So in that case, the flow the flowing top to, to the top process can be slowed down or they, they kind of just uh, you know, move around in the, in the liquid. So in that case, we don't see that uh, undesirable fat globules flow on the top, but the, the, when the um, milk product is stored for a long time, then the emulsion kind of um, phase separates. Then in that case, we can still see those um, big droplets of the fat, okay? Any questions about the homogenizer? Okay. All right, so the next one, the holding tube. So this is the one that uh, it's very similar in our, um, in our uh, uh, dairy innovation center. Okay, so you can see the tubes, they are very long. They kind of um, um, loop together. Uh, and the loop. Um, so in that case, we can extend their length without too much uh, space required in the facility. Okay, so um, so we can control the tube dimension and the flow rate to control the holding time here. Okay, so those are holding tubes. So you might wonder that uh, the holding tube we are not controlling the temperature at all, right? Because it's it seems like the tube is directly exposed to the air, but because the um, temperature, um, though the, uh, the, the, the processing time is so short that the temperature drop becomes negligible in the holding tube. So that's why we don't have to worry about uh, the temperature keeping during this uh, time. And uh, um, I wish we have a lab that we can measure the, the, the the, the temperature comes in and the temperature goes out. So you guys can kind of see what's temperature difference at the entrance and the exit. 
So basically, uh, based on my experience, they are very close to each other. So that's why we don't have to worry about that. Okay. Okay, so the last part um, is the flow diversion valve. Okay, so we just talk about uh, why do we need this valve. So basically, you can see there are uh, uh, one inlet. Okay, so the milk comes in at the entrance, and uh, there are two exits. Okay, depending on wh wh where the valve um, goes up, moves upwards or downwards. So as we just just discussed. Um, there's a temperature sensor in the flow diversion valve, okay? And if the temperature is greater than um, our required temperature, for example, 72 degrees C, and then the temperature will kind of set down. So the, the milk can go to the, to the top. And the, so that, that top exit is connected to the finished product line. Okay, and if the product uh, is not meeting the required temperature, and then the, this gate is kind of shutting down, and then we have to divert this flow back to the, to the, um, to the feeding tank. Okay? And uh, you can see there's a small leak detector here. Right? Do you guys know why that we place the heat, uh, leak detector on this location? Any guess? Uh, is it because the air flows out, it goes up, like any trapped air or bubbles will go up? Yes, Armin, uh, that's one point, the air bubble. Yes, we can expel the air bubble if there's any in the system, right? Any other uh, thoughts? So if you look at the, the spot of the leak detector, it's kind of in the same direction or same side of the finished product line, right? So what if that we have leak and the, our product is not safe that we want to divert it back to the feeding tank? And if there's any leak to the finished product line, then because of the leak detector and the finished product line, they're placed in the same side, there will be some liquid comes out in the detector. So if our product is not meeting the required, uh, required temperature and we have some product leak to the um, finished product line, our leak detector basically tells us, okay, there's some issue with that. Does that make sense, guys? Right, because you can see that uh, those two exit, they are kind of connected to each other, right? So this is a sign that, uh, so the lead detector basically tells us now the gate is open, right? But in the case that the gate is not very, not well closed, um, while we want to divert the flow, the, it will kind of alarm, uh, alarm us. So that's the purpose of the lead detector. Okay, does it make sense, guys? So that's why in the, they're in the same side. Okay, so flow diversion valve, um, basically it's a type temperature sensor, okay? And it's placed after holding tube to check what's the temperature after um, the pressurization process, okay? So when the temperature is greater than required temperature, we can forward the flow to the regeneration section. And if it's lower than required temperature, we'll divert it back to the balance tank, okay? All right. And the last, uh, the very last part, we have another uh, very tiny safety device that is called a vacuum break breaker. Basically vacuum breaker, uh, breaker controls the, uh, the pressure to prevent uh, contamination. And uh, usually uh, it's uh, placed at the very last uh, discharge spot of the product. And we have to put it 12 inch higher um, than those unpressurized product. Okay, the highest level on unpressurized product. That is also to, um, to uh, prevent any, um, any contamination because uh, when we open the system or we shut down the system, there will be a pressure instability that will cause 
the flow, the backflow, or you know the unstability of the flow. Once the flow goes back, then there's a some, or the flow goes move uh, move fast, and then it we, we might have some product that is not uh, processed well, right? So in that case, a vacuum breaker kind of prevent those kind of scenario, uh, especially when the system is you know turned on or turned off and uh, it kind of maintains the, the pressure and it prevents the contamination. So that's a vacuum breaker, okay? So, so let's look back to the regeneration um, uh, section. So in the regeneration section, we have two streams of the milk, right? We have the raw milk at the initial temperature TRI and uh, it comes out at temperature T R out, the raw milk out. So R O is the raw milk out, R I is raw milk in. And on the other side, we have the processed milk or pasteurized milk, right? So the, assume we have a temperature of the um, inlet, um, inlet uh, uh, pasteurized milk as the P I, T P I and the outlet temperature of the pasteurized milk, TPO, then we can plot out their temperature curves, right? In the heat regeneration section, right? So if we have the x-axis as the length along the exchanger, and we have y-axis as the temperature, um, if we plot out the, the raw milk, it'll go up, right? And if we plot out the um, pasteurized milk, it'll go, um, it'll be cooled down, right? So let's, um, so there are some temperatures that we can monitor. Um, so the temperature gap between the TRO, which is the outlet temperature of the raw milk and the inlet temperature of the raw milk, we, if we heat up, we use A to note the temperature difference of them and we used Y temperature to note the temperature difference between the, um, the TPI, which is the pasteurized milk inlet and the raw milk inlet. We can calculate the regeneration percentage. So this is something like, a, um, uh, so this is one of the parameters we use to determine the efficiency of the um, heat exchange, uh, heat exchanger. Okay, so basically, A is the um, how much temperature the lower temperature side has raised, and Y temperature is the temperature gap between the heating medium and uh, and uh, the heating media and uh, the raw product. Okay, so their percentage, their ratio percentage is noted as the regeneration percentage. Okay, so let's do a quick sample so you have better idea how to, what does that mean and how to calculate that. Okay. Okay, so let's solve this question together. Uh, so milk is being pasteurized using an HTST system around the regeneration section, raw milk enters at 40 degree F and the leaves at 145 degree F, okay? So our raw milk temperature goes from 40 degree F to 140 degree, five degree F. And our pasteurized milk enters, enters the system at 175 degree F and the leaves at 70 degree F. And the question is, what is the regeneration percentage of this system? So let's solve this question together. Okay, so I will give you another example to practice. So what we do is that uh, we simply, you know, write down those conditions. Okay, so raw in is 40, 40 degree F, raw out 145 degree F, okay. And the pressurized in 175 degree F, pressurized out 70 degree F, okay. So what we do next, guys, we plug in the temperature, right, to the equation. So first we calculate what is A value and what is the Y value, right? So Y value uh, use the equation that I showed you in the last slide. 
And then we can calculate, calculate the percentage of regeneration by dividing A by the Y, okay? So the regeneration percentage here is 78 degree uh, percentage, okay? Any questions here? It should be very straightforward, right? So I will get, give you a chance to practice uh, for the next, next question. So uh, just by following the procedures here, okay, so calculate the temperature gap between, uh, to calculate A value and Y value. And finally, we can calculate the regeneration percentage. Okay, so this is a question that I want you guys to practice. Okay, um, so uh, same, same thing, we have the pressurized uh, pressurization HTST system and the raw milk comes in at 40 degree F leaves at 155 and the pressurized milk enters at 175 degree F and leaves at 65 degree F and what is the regeneration system uh, percentage of this system and I'll, I will give you about one minute and uh, we'll check the answer afterwards okay could you go back to the last slide really quick yeah yeah that one with the equations okay Thank you. Sure. Let me just copy paste the equation um, to the next slide so it might be better. Okay. Oh, let me also put these numbers here. Okay. Anyone finished? Okay, I saw many of you nodding heads. Okay, all right, let's check the answer together. Okay, so first of all, we write down all the conditions we have, right? Raw in 40 degree F, raw out 155 degree F, and pressurized in 175 degree F, pressurized out 65 degree F. And then we calculate what is A value and Y value. Okay. So A value is equal to TRO minus TRI, 115 degree F, and Y value, 135 degree F. Okay. And finally, we check, we can uh, divide them, okay, get 85 degree uh, percentage. Okay. Everyone got it? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So, so that's the theoretical uh, way that we calculate the regeneration uh, percentage. Uh, it, it, for a lot of uh, heat um, regeneration uh, system, we use the same parameter to 
kind of identify or evaluate how efficient are they? Okay. And second, let's talk about what is the impact of the flow direction. Like Carly just mentioned that uh, she, uh, why is the plate that plays the, the uh, opposite way? Okay, so that's why, that's the reason that you can see here the, the milk comes in, right? The, in the, towards the right direction and the, the raw milk comes in towards the left direction. So they kind of, they form kind of a counter flow. So what if we change the flow direction what if we um, um, we uh, we move this flow diversion valve to the right side? So the uh, so the the the, um, the the pressurized milk comes in this uh, from this side, the right side, and gets out from the left side. So they kind of move co-current flow. Uh, which which way do you think is more efficient? Counter current. Counter current. Why, Julia? I was just remembering we did a, a, what's it called, like project in 330 with like counter current. And I, I don't know, it's like, just works better. Okay, okay. That's a good guess uh, because you can see many systems in, are designed that way, right? So let's, uh, let's check if that's a real um, or if that's always true in, 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 uh, in the next, next a few slides. Hopefully we'll have a better idea how to uh, determine that. So basically, if we think about uh, um, there are two types of flow, right? The first one is co-current flow, and second one is counter-current flow, okay? So in the co-current flow, basically, you can see that our heating media and the cold um, product that comes at the same spot, right? So at the very beginning, their temperature gap is huge. And then later on, they kind of slowly merge or uh, converge together, right, to a smaller distance. And in the counter current flow, their temperature gap looks quite constant throughout the entire process, right? Because when the um, product comes in, it's the it's a heating media that already used to heat up the food product, so the temperature is lowest. And once the heat product uh, um, the, the, the raw product moves through the tube, the heating media also gets hotter and hotter. So that's their, um, if we plot out their temperature curve, that's their typical um, plot, okay? So which way is more efficient? So from uh, FSN 330, we learned about uh, the, uh, uh, the heat exchange efficiency, right? It's, it's something we call it heat flux. Uh, it's noted by Q value, okay? So the Q dot mean, just means the heat uh, flux per second, right? It's, it's just the time unit. And uh, you can see that uh, it's an equation, the heat exchange efficiency is an equation of HA T2 minus T1, right? So this is uh, something uh, help you to recall from the 330. So H value is heat transfer coefficient, right? This is the, uh, um, the intrinsic property of the heat exchanger, right? And uh, the T2 minus T1, basically it's a temperature gap. So basically if you have larger temperature across the heat plate, then you have a better heat exchange efficiency. The A value is the surface area where the heat transfer takes place. So in our case, if we have a system that is well built our heat transfer coefficient is like a constant and our surface area is also a constant, right? Because that's something we related to tube, we cannot replace the tube. Um, but the, the only thing different here with the co-current flow or counter-current flow is the temperature gap between the heating media and the, the raw milk, okay? So that's something that, but, but in the real case, that temperature gap keeps changing, right? It's not a constant. So, so in that case, if we have this T2 minus T1 keep changing, how do we know which way is more efficient? Because from here, from the counter current flow, the, the gap can stays constant, but for the co-current flow, 
the gap is very huge at the very beginning, right? Which means the heat transfer is very efficient at the very beginning, but kind of slow down through the tube. Does it make sense, guys? Okay, but for that, um, for the um, counter current flow, that temperature gap remains constant. So in this case, we bring up a new parameter that is called log mean temperature. So the log mean temperature is to help us determine what is the average gap or what is the um, time average gap between these two, um, the, the heating media and the, the cooling side. Okay, because otherwise it's hard for us to find out what is the, you know, um, the, the, the average temperature gap here, okay? So it's used to, it's labeled as DERT T L M um, in a very com complicated equation, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have two, uh, two parameters here, DERT T1. So DERT T1 is the temperature gap at the very beginning, at the entrance of the, of the heating ex heat exchanger. And the DERT T2, is the time, uh, is temperature gap at the exit of the of the heat exchanger, okay. And the same thing for the counter current flow. All right. So, in this case, the dead TLM can be used to describe the overall or the um, averaged temperature gap throughout the heat exchange system. Does it make sense, guys? It's just like a mathematical approach to estimate the average, because if they are curves, it's hard for us to you know, anticipate. If they are um, straight lines, we can say, well, the average can be maybe uh, T1 plus T2 divided by two, right? But uh, in many cases, they are curves, right? If you look at the real case, um, in both cases, they are, they are curves, which means they are not linear. So in that case, uh, we have to use a uh, log mean temperature, okay? So let's do a quick practice to uh, calculate the log mean temperature. And uh, that, uh, that will help us to determine which flow type is more efficient here. All right, so again, let me copy paste um, the, okay. So let me put my equation here. So I'll give you maybe uh, uh, one minute. You guys can try to practice and we will we'll go through this question together Okay, and I'll let you guys practice another one. Okay, so quickly, uh, if you guys want to try, you can try first. Okay, so I guess you guys are still working on it. And uh, um, let's go through this together. So I'll let you guys practice for the next one. Okay. Because we uh, have maybe uh, 20 more minutes. Okay, so, 
So to calculate delta T1, we use basically delta T1 is the temperature gap at the entrance, right? So at the entrance, we have the temperature gap uh, 161 degree F divide, uh, minus 81 degree F, right? So the first problem is the uh, delta T1. Um, and the second term here, 131 minus 121 is the delta T2, right? And on the bottom, we just take the learn of the of these two temperature. And then finally, it's close to 21.64 degrees C, okay? Okay, so I will let you guys practice the next one. Any questions about this, the equation here? Okay, I'll let you guys yeah, practice. I, yes. I keep mm -hmm. getting a number in the 30s. I don't know, and I just like typed it in. Uh, you, you got, know. Carly, you got 30? Yeah, I got like 33.6. So I don't know if I'm just, and I redid the calculation a couple of times, but. Um, what, what, what else? Uh, any, any, any other of you got different numbers? Yeah, in the chat they're saying we all got 33. Okay, okay, that might be my uh, miscalculation. Let, let, me, let me do a quick calculation here. Okay, so on the top we have 30, right? On the top, we have uh, 40 minus oh, 80 minus 10, 70. And the bottom, we have learn four. Uh, 70, eight, learn eight. Okay, you're right. So it's 33.66. Is that correct? No? Okay, good job, good job. Okay. So I, I think I plug in the wrong number here. Okay. Great. Okay, so let's do a quick cal uh, practice here. Okay. okay. Again, another quick practice. Okay. Anyone wants to share your answer? Oh my god, was 34. Good, good. Anyone else got 34? Everyone got 34? Okay, great. So, same thing, we just plug in those figured numbers and uh, you know, just uh, do quick calculation. So it's 34.76 degree F. They're very close, but uh, the, 
the counter current flow is slightly uh, larger in terms of gap, right? So here comes a question. Um, how do we determine which flow type is more efficient? So in the previous calculations, we got the co-current flow, the temperature gap, the log mean temperature gap is 33, right? And the counter current flow, we got slightly higher, 34.76, right? So, and this is what my previous wrong calculation, but we have the counter current flow greater than the co current flow. Like Kali said, the, the counter current flow is more efficient here. Um, but my question is, is this always the case? So I was initially trying to make this as a breakout room discussion, but we are running out of time and we have another discussion at the very end. So I'm going to skip this breakout room discussion. So just want, just want to ask you guys, do you think it's always the case that we have counter current flow more efficient? It's hard to say, right? So let me ask uh, um, in another way. So if we have very long processing time, uh, if we have, a, so it might be, uh, because uh, if you look at the cold current flow, the temperature gap is huge at the very beginning, right? So it might be better when we are very short processing time. So what if, so for example, if we cut off the processing um, at, the, at the probably one fourth here um, and the one fourth of the tube lens, then probably we'll have more efficient, uh, more heat exchange efficiency in this type of heat exchanger, right? In this type of flow uh, pattern. But if we have a uh, very long uh, processing um, uh, uh, the tube lens, then the uh, co Counter current flow probably works better, right? Because that kind of maintain the temperature gap, right? For the first one, the temperature gap kind of converge um, to, uh, towards the end of the tube. So it's it's pretty much depending on the how how long we want to hold it and how long is the tube length. Does it make sense, guys? So which one is more efficient? Every time we have to do some calculation to figure out, right? Depending on the T1 minus T2. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the log mean temperature difference. Okay. So now we know how to determine which one is more efficient. Um, so finally, we'll talk about uh, what is a UHT process. Okay. So uh, in previous slides, we talked about uh, a, uh, the pressurization system and the, with the flow rate and those, um, how to determine um, the, the each key component works. And here, let's talk about uh, uh, the UHTS because the UHT is very oftenly applied in the food industry right now, especially for milk products, right? So for milk products, uh, we use a lot of UHT combined with a septic processing system. So uh, aseptic processing, I, I guess you have learned in previous class, uh, basically we process the milk and the, the container in two um, lines and they will be uh, packaged in a sterile, uh, sterile region to eliminate any contamination. Okay. So that's a, uh, so for UHT process, we typically process at 135 degrees C for two to three seconds which is much shorter than other processing uh, system, okay? So uh, if you look at the flow chart, we have the container processed on the left side being sterilized and the food product uh, processed on the other line, it's under a UHT, and they will meet in the aseptic zone to be packaged together. For example, a lot of milk products are packaged in this way and they can, they're typically um, stable, um, uh, uh, in to be stored in room temperature. Okay. 
So in order to determine how long that we want to process our food, we, want, we need to consider a lot of factors. Uh, for example, we, we want to maximize the nutrition retention. Another case, we want to eliminate any potential pathogens, right? So in that case, we, uh, we use the plot on the right side. It's a very busy plot. You can see there are several lines on the, on the, on the, on the, on the plot. And, uh, and then we have a region here. Let me explain it later. So on the x-axis, you can see this is a temperature, right? 110 degrees C, 20, 120, 130, 140. And on the y-axis is the heating time. So for example, and those lines means if we want to reach this type of um, uh, 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 heating effect, uh, what is the equivalent processing time we want to uh, apply. For example, if we want to destroy 3% of the thiamine, thiamine is one of the nutrients here, so we can either process it at 400, uh, uh, at, uh, for 400 seconds at about 105 degrees C, or we can process at uh, 110 degrees C at, uh, for, for 200 seconds. So those, so every point on this line, they basically reach the same amount of reduction. So they are equivalent on this line. So does it make sense, guys? Because we have the uh, Z value, right? Um, for every temperature, so, for, so if we want to reduce the D value by tenfold, by one fold, there's certain temperature we want to raise. So basically this uh, is a, a Z value line, if you look at this, right? So if we see any region that is above this line, that means it's overprocessed, right? So for example, we have the 3% 3, uh, 3 reduction line here. If we have a point on the, in, the, in the yellow box, for example, in the yellow box, it's processed for 100, uh, for, uh, at 110 degrees C for 2000 min, uh, seconds. In that case, it's overprocessed, right? So that's any point that's above this line means overprocessing. And any process below this line means underprocessing. That makes sense, guys? So for example, we have 3% reduction line here. If we have a point here, which means we process at 110 degrees C for 100 seconds, then means we destroy less than 3% of the thiamine. So that's what means it above and below the, the, these lines, okay? So here, as you can see, the, the, the red region under the 3% reduction curve means under this region, we're destroying less than 3% of thiamine, which means we kind of maximize the retention of the nutri nutrition value, right? And also if you look at the 1% of the um, lysine destruction line, it's even higher. So under this, this region, it means we destroyed less than 3% of lysamine and destroyed less than 1% of lysine. Does it make, make sense, guys? Okay. Okay, great. So this is for the nutrition maximization part, right? And let's look at another two curves. The dash curve and the, these two, this solid curve, they are the reduction line of the thermophilic spores. So those spores are the, are the pathogens we want to eliminate, right? So, so those lines already mean that it's a uh, nine log the reduction, okay? So if we look at this line, if we process that at, at any condition that is above this line, that means we are destroying more than nine log of the thermophilic spores, right? Does it make sense, guys? Okay, great. And any curve, any point that below that line means we're destroying less than that. So 
So in that case, we can find a region, okay, that we kill the majority of the pathogen while maintain the max, uh, while we maintain the maximum amount of nutrition. So this is how we consider to, um, to find out the best processing time. It's basically we are considering two sides, nutrition sides and the pathogen side, right? For example, the uh, UHT region here, you can see uh, it's one, if we process the 135 degrees C, um, the processing time can be, uh, can be very low, can be a few seconds, right? So this is the UHT region. Any questions about this curve, about this plot? So this just gives us an idea that how we determine the pasteurization condition, right? If you go to the industry, they want to you optimize the best uh, time and temperature. What you do is that you plot out those nutrition drop curves and plot out those Pageant drop curves, and then find out the mutual interest that uh, we can destroy the much of as much as passion and the while maintain them um, as much as nutrition that you want. Right. So that's the things to consider when you design a pasteurization pasteurization system. Okay. So a couple advantages about uh, UHT processing. So uh, so because uh, we are only processing for a few seconds, right? So we. Uh, kill the microorganism, but uh, we kind of maximize the nutrition retention. And uh, the shelf life can be long if it's processed with aseptic processing, right? And the aseptic processing, we can uh, adjust the packaging size by ourselves because uh, uh, all the milk is processed before package, right? So, so we don't have to worry how much, how large the package size because the large container size, we have to, if we think about the retort, we have to retort it longer time than the smaller package. But in our case, we can package it larger or smaller in those aseptic region, depending on what is the consumer need. Okay. So, but difficulties is that uh, um, the aseptic region or aseptic zone is always difficult to, difficult to create because uh, we can, it's hardly for us to maintain the, the sterility of a, 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 bigger, a bigger area. And it requires very complex equipment set up and a, a very uh, regulatory or periodic uh, um, cleaning process. And also because the temperature is so high, uh, the temperature control becomes so important that we have to make sure it's only processed for two to three seconds. Otherwise it will cause overcooking problem, right? And finally, um, the quality can uh, is also very um, sensitive because uh, within that uh, three, two to three seconds of time, we can easily go from under processing to over processing, right? So those are all the um, difficulties with the UHT process. And we have different heating uh, way, uh, heating process uh, to uh, to achieve those uh, rapid heating uh, approach, because in our uh, uh, in the in the UHT, uh, you guys can see that uh, the heating process is only two to three seconds, which means we want to heat it up as quick as possible, so that the heating up window does not cause much damage, right, um, to the to the overcooking issue. So there are a couple of ways to, we use to heat that up quickly. Uh, one way is called direct heating. Basically, we mix the steam and product together. I'm not sure if you guys learned about it in the 204 class, but this is from uh, the 204 class I taught, I taught uh, early this quarter. Um, so direct heating, basically we mix steam and product together, but that is the most efficient way to heat it up, right? But the problem is that that will dilute our product due to the um, steam addition. And the steam has to be uh, drinkable or portable because there will be, finally, there will be, um, uh, be part of our product. And the indirect heating is more common. Basically, you use a very, very robust heat exchanger, for example, plate heat exchanger. 
that I showed you the video. And uh, in this case, the heating and the cooling process can be done in a few seconds. Okay. But the problem is that the, the, those plates are so tiny, so the cleaning can, can be very difficult. So those are two examples of how to quickly heat up or cool down a, a UHT process. So now uh, I want to uh, have you guys quickly discuss how to design a, um, what are the general steps we, don't, we need to consider when designing a pasteurization system. So because we are running out of time, I will just uh, put you guys into a, a small group for about one minute and then we'll come back and then check our answers. Okay, so, okay, breakout rooms. I'll put you guys to nine groups. Okay. Come in. Hi, Max. Hey. Sorry, hey. I'm still teaching my uh, 474 lecture and oh, uh, I'm right. late for five to 10 minutes. Can you let the money low? Yeah. Okay, right. thank you.
Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, so any ideas, any thoughts want to share? My group talked about how it was like important to consider possibly like the viscosity of your product and then mm -hmm. how that would affect, like if you needed to change like your diameter of your tube or like your holding tube length uh, to get the heat transfer all settled. Excellent. So the property of food basically to so that we can select the best uh, the optimal heat exchanger and the tubing, right? Okay, so what else, guys? Our group talked about um, how they're like how much spacing you have in the facility, and that might determine like the type of exchanger you have on top of viscosity, of course. Good point, Chris. So um, the Basically, we want to decide what is the capacity we can run uh, and by selecting what the type of heat exchanger and what type of equipment, right? Okay, so because we are running out of time, so uh, we use all the time today. Uh, let, let me share what I have as more uh, like a general. You guys mentioned very good point. And let's see what is um, starting from very beginning, how we think about this problem. So first of all, we will be given one type eat, um, uh, different type of food, right? Depending on whether it's juice, whether it's a milk, or whether it's other type of fluid products, uh, what will be the potential microorganism there? And what will be the nutrients we want to maintain? And what are their viscosity? What are, um, uh, are the enzymes we want to destroy, right? So this is, so first we need to know enough about the of food properties. And second, we need to uh, know what is the requirement of the process. For example, some of the milk products, they are stored in the room temperature, right? They're ster sterilized. And some products, they, are, they have to be refrigerated. So depending on the storage condition and the shelf life, we kind of determine which process we want to go, whether it's HTST or UHT, or aseptic processing. So this is a general, very big design of the, uh, of the entire uh, uh, um, process decision, right? So which process role to want to go with. And then we can, you, uh, after we determine which system we want to use, we can work on how to optimize it, right? So we learned about all the flow types, all the heat changer, Right. So, and also the viscosity you guys mentioned. So that will help us to best optimize the holding time by adjusting flow rate, tube length, or tube dimension, um, like uh, uh, the tube size. Right. For viscous food, we want to uh, maybe increase flow rate or uh, to make sure the pressure is enough. Right. And uh, so those are um, the optimization for each small segment. And the second, uh, we want to maximize the heat regeneration to recover more energy to meet the sustainability uh, uh, requirement, right? And also we want to optimize the heat transfer, right? And uh, we talk about the flow direction choose and uh, today, and also of course the tube dimension, right? And finally, um, we want to select the, the best heat exchangers, either it's a plate heat exchanger or tube heat exchanger. Right. Sometimes we even use the direct steam. So that's all the uh, optimization of the pasteurization system. Does it make any sense, guys? So that's the overall um, way or the uh, more strategic way to think about uh, the entire system design. Okay. So all the physics we learned is for the optimization, but we need to decide what system we want to go first. 
All right, guys. So that's all about the class today. Uh, so we talk about uh, the uh, criteria purpose of pa uh, food pasteurization, uh, different pasteurization system. Those are the reviews of the previous lecture, uh, previous courses. And then uh, what are the key components in the HTST and the UHT, UHT system? And what is heat uh, energy regeneration? What is how to calculate it? And uh, we also learn about concept of the log mean temperature. Uh, why do we have to calculate in the realistic world? Because the temperature gap is not a constant value and we need to approximate that. And, uh, and also you, based on the log mean temperature, we can determine whether we want to use cold current flow or counter current flow, right? And finally, uh, we uh, move to a more broad picture to think about what are the factors to consider when you are assigned to design a pasteurization, pasteurization process, okay? So that's all for the class today. Uh, it's a long lecture and uh, 